Hello, everybody. Good afternoon, and welcome to another free Florida Bar CLE brought to you by Rocket Matter and Legal Fuel. So, we are really excited about today's CLE. It's a very hot topic the ethics of communicating with clients via text messages. And we have the pleasure to have host David Budding with us today. He's actually at HQ. Um, he is the founder of Encrypted Information Exchange LLC, which is a company that provides encrypted solutions for legal communication. So he is definitely the expert in this particular field. He is also a former practicing attorney at an AM Law 100 firm, and he developed Encrypted Information Exchange LLC based on his years of legal experience. So let's give it up for David Budding. David, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, I really appreciate that introduction. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is David Budding. I'm your presenter today. Uh, a little bit about myself. I used to be a litigator uh, at an AM100 firm in Chicago. I specialized in uh, real estate uh, litigation, so eviction, title insurance, defense, all that good stuff. Uh, so uh, based on that experience, uh, I, I developed Encry Encrypted Information Exchange, EIU Legal is our product. Uh, today, I want to talk to you about uh, three things. Uh, the threats that small law firms face these days, your ethical obligations when it comes to communicating with your client via text or, frankly, any means, and how best to protect yourself, yourself, your firm, and your clients uh, when you're communicating this way. And then we'll have a little bit of time at the end for uh, some question and answer. Um, so here we go. So basically, we all know that we're living in the age of hacking. Uh, Equifax, Yahoo, Uber, these are all massive hacks that have occurred in the last few years that have received massive, massive uh, coverage in the media. Uh, so this is something that, that's happening nearly every day. But hackers have expanded the scope of their attacks to include smaller companies. Uh, between January of 2015 and December of 2016, uh, there was a 2,000% increase in identified exposed losses and email scans that were reported in 50 states and 131 countries. Uh, it affected tens of thousands of businesses and there was 1.5 billion in losses. Those are just the breaches that we know about. Uh, there are laws changing to address that where, uh, if, if you're familiar with the, the changes in the privacy law in California and some other states, it's a rapidly evolving topic that, um, you know, companies are going to have to be reporting more and more when these things happen. They aren't gonna be able to bury it. And unfortunately, law firms are being targeted as well. Uh, this is just uh, for uh, law firms over 500 uh, lawyers, but uh, in uh, 2016, approximately 40% of the largest law firms were attacked. 25% recounted hefty fees to correct the problems. And one in six also reported loss of important files or information. That's, that's just a staggering amount, and that's just larger law firms. As we get in further into this, I'll talk about uh, how hackers are targeting smaller law firms as well. And the reasons why firms are being targeted, uh, basically, it's, it's two reasons. One, lawyers handle sensitive data of their clients. It's intellectual property, it's financial information, it's legal strategies, it's timing of wires in a real estate deal. These are all juicy targets for, for hackers, for malicious third parties. Um, and it, there was a report that Verizon did back in 2015 that uh, indicated that corporate lawyers are the easiest people to fish. So of all of their clients, corporate lawyers were the worst. Uh, and you know, law firms are attacked pretty much on a daily basis. Uh, we'll have the opportunity to circulate this material around to you. So if you wanna check out the links, I really encourage you to check out this 2017 top law firms attacked. Uh, it's, it's very, very interesting. But as law firms are being targeted and attacked, uh, the, the obligations that lawyers have are changing. Uh, late last year, the ABA released a ethics opinion, opinion 484, that said that in the event of a breach at a law firm, lawyers are ethically obligated to inform their clients of the breach. That is just staggering. Uh, so those numbers we saw earlier about the 40% law firms, I imagine that number is a lot higher. And we're gonna learn more about that as, these, uh, as, as people start adhering to these new rules. Now, let's, let's talk about threats here for a second. And you'll notice that a lot of these threats dovetail together. Uh, one leads into another, one is a component of another. So 
This is just intended to give you sort of a 10,000 foot view of some of the challenges that are facing law firms that exist that are out there. Um, so a big one that we see a lot of is so-called ransomware, where hackers will install malicious uh, software uh, on, on a firm's network and then seize control of it. Uh, once they've seized control of it, they'll reach out and they'll ask, they'll ask for ransom. Uh, you know, so, you know, they'll give you the keys to your network if you pay X and, you know, it's Bitcoin or something like that. Uh, and that really obviously puts lawyers in a really tough position because, you know, when, when you're, you're, you can't access your intellectual property, you know, your work product, the things that you do, you can't function as a firm unless you can keep it all in your head, uh, which I haven't met a lawyer who can. Uh, the next one is, is so-called phishing. Uh, it's where, Hackers will uh, install malicious uh, software on an email link, and then they'll send it to someone in your organization and try to convince them to open it. You know, I'm, I'm sure everyone's received uh, emails from Microsoft, allegedly from Microsoft or something like that, that says, oh, we need your password, whatever. This is, this is sort of that, that sort of attack. They're, they're basically phishing for information. They're phishing for you to enter the link. They're phishing for you to give up your password, your username some other sensitive material that they can then use to uh, attack your network. Uh, a threat that we've already sort of touched down is malware, where they will use a email link or they'll find some way, if it's, a, uh, if it's a hard drive or something like that, install it to your network in order to bring, put this virus in it, that'll uh, you know, compromise your network. Uh, there are a variety of ways that they can, they can do this by email link, by hard drive, uh, by hacking into your Wi-Fi, something like that. They're looking to install something on your network to compromise uh, what you want to do. Um, uh, another big one, and probably the most important one that we're going to be spending a lot of time talking about today is individuals, or so-called social engineering hacking, where uh, hackers are using email, or can also be over the phone or whatever, will we'll try to attack your organization by targeting employees by getting them to give up their information. And what we're gonna discover as we go through this um, presentation today, that people are the weakest link in your network. That if you have all the most sophisticated encryption or firewalls in the world, it simply isn't enough when, uh, when an individual breaches their training, uh, violates protocol, does something they're not supposed to. And it doesn't have to be malicious, they can just make a mistake. People do it all the time. Um, Let's see, the final is spoofing that we're going to touch on a little bit today. Spoofing is just total impersonation. Uh, there was this uh, case I read about recently in Hong Kong where uh, some Taiwanese hackers assumed uh, the, the identity of contacts in their WhatsApp, in contacts in their WhatsApp. Uh, you know, so basically they, the hackers in Taiwan took uh, inactive WhatsApp accounts and then started uh, you know, messaging with, uh, with, with the contacts and saying, hey, uh, it's been a while, but uh, you know, uh, I, I, have a, I, I need money for an investment, I need money for a medical procedure, whatever. And so by doing that, by impersonating someone else, they were able to get some of these, these, these well-meaning folks to send them money. Uh, you know, they, the the uh, hackers were eventually you know, discovered and arrested, but it, was, uh, it cost a lot, it hurt a lot of folks. Uh, you know, there was another case a few years back in New York where uh, hackers in China actually spoofed uh, the lawyer's email address, where they, they made one change in, uh, in the address. Uh, the lawyer, I think, was using an AOL account, and they made some modification, and so they actually texted or emailed with, with the clients of the lawyer about a real estate deal posing as the lawyer, and they were able to uh, uh, redirect some wires and things like that. It was pretty, uh, pretty horrific. Um, and also, you know, from from these threats it's not just uh things that are immediately apparent like they're stealing money they're taking over your network uh they're they're doing something like that sometimes it could be something as simple as trading on your uh on the information that they glean uh, if they get an earnings report or something like that hackers will just sit and look at the information that you have and then make trades on the stock market based on the information so, you know, they're, they're defrauding the public, they're at large, uh, and, and they're doing it in a very sneaky way that that's not, you know, easily, that that's not apparent. And uh, another one that we're, uh, we want to talk a little bit about today uh, that's uh, 
my technology partner, Mike Vansky, who's, uh, who basically does our encryption and everything else, uh, it's, you know, said that we don't need to include this, but I just wanted to talk real quick because when people think of hacking, they think of this, just brute force attacks where uh, a hacker will, will just attack your, uh, your encryption or whatever using uh, a, a computer and just over and over throw perme permeations of, of an encryption key at it until they eventually break it. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about that a lot more later than when we get to the portion on encryption. Um, so real quick, I, I want to talk about a case study that I think uh, is relevant to most attorneys. Uh, I'm, a, I'm an Illinois attorney and uh, just about every, every lawyer up there one way or another has done a real estate transaction. I, I assume it's probably similar here. Uh, you know, either they're personally involved or, or they're handling it themselves. Um, so hackers uh, found that uh, real estate transactions were kind of easy pickings for this. Uh, they would use uh, email scams uh, to basically target everyone in, in the transaction and try to get people to uh, give up uh, wire instructions, try to redirect wires, try to basically, you know, pinch, uh, whatever cash is being used to pay off a mortgage or whatever other lien was on the property at the time. And, uh, you know, there was, uh, there was a 480% increase of this in 2016 of uh, scammers, hackers trying to do this. And they targeted 5.3 billion uh, in, in assets trying to, trying to get it. Uh, you know, this is for folks who've been involved in real estate transactions, you know, it can be kind of a, kind of an odd situation. In fact, my wife, uh, Yesterday, uh, our, our downstairs neighbors uh, in the first floor of our condo unit are selling their property. And, uh, you know, so they're, they're, they have to put together title and things like that. Uh, my wife is the president of our condo board, uh, where she rules with a, with a velvet glove. But um, she, she gets an email asking for title. It was, it was from the lender. The lender had sent her an email asking for title. And it was some person over there who didn't know who was who, who had a list of contacts who just sent it out. Uh, the seller was not included on the email. The seller's attorney was not included on the email, so it was not going to the right person at all. But when you're involved in these real estate transactions, you get these emails from from odd folks, and you need to confirm who they are because it could be hackers trying to penetrate this, trying to find out what's going on, trying to be in a position where they can eventually intercept the wire. Uh, you know, uh, my wife just forwarded the email to the seller's attorney and and let uh, the lender uh, the the lender know that she was not the correct person. She didn't say who the seller was and forward that information. She uh, turned it over to the seller so they could go ahead and handle it because she didn't know who the person was, which I, I think was probably the, probably the right move. You know, I find in my own practice uh, when, when it came to uh, getting wiring instructions from clients and things like that, I would never use email. I would ask them to take photos of, of their wiring instructions and text it to me in an encrypted uh, text messaging app, actually using the one that we've developed uh, so I, I knew it was secure, and then I would actually hand my handwritten wire instructions over to the uh, to the the closer at closing. So there was no no risk of interception. Uh, all right, now on on to texting. So basically, you know, texting is incredibly popular. We see you know Americans are texting 81% are texting on a regular basis. That's every day. Uh, this is becoming our primary form of communication. Uh, we text more than we call now. Uh, we, <clears throat> and you know, folks younger than 50, this is truly their primary mode of communication. When they're talking to friends or trying to do something or catching up, they're not doing it on the phone, they're messaging back and forth. Now, this trend, uh, the, law, the law industry is not immune to it. And lawyers and clients are turning more and more to texting. Now, there, there are reasons for that ease. Uh, it's easy to do, your phone's right there with you all the time. Efficiency, you can keep your clients up to date uh, without having to get on the phone, without having to interrupt their days or interrupt yours and let them know what's going on. And there's a certainty of receipt and it's very effective. It, it's an ability to create a running dialogue without directly interacting that also creates a record. Now, obviously there are concerns about texting as well. Uh, these are the primary ones that, that I've seen. Lawyers are worried about their ethical obligations to their clients. Uh, obviously, there are confidentiality concerns when it comes to texting. You know, you, you don't know what the technology is, whether or not, you know, it's, it's appropriately encrypted. Uh, there's also the concern of being overly accessible. Uh, you know, a lot, of, a lot of attorneys don't want to give up their cell phone number, and I think and sometimes for very good reason. Uh, the next issue is uh, record keeping, record preservation. Um, you know, 
<clears throat> it's it's very difficult to keep records of text messaging because you know after a period of time the texts just start disappearing. Like if if you use an Apple as I do, uh, you can go back many months and all the texts will be there, but eventually you go further back, it's not recoverable unless you go through, take some extraordinary steps. Uh, additionally, you know, lawyers look at, at, at texting as being a little overly simplistic. It, it doesn't feel orderly. You know, you're, suddenly emojis are popping up in your client correspondence, which is a troubling thing at times. <laughs> but uh, that's, that, that's sort of the, that's why lawyers are, get worried about texting. Now, when it comes to your, your ethical obligations, to your duties, in text messaging, there are a couple of rules you need to keep in mind, and they basically go hand in hand in this. One is the duty of competence. The other is rules uh, is the duty of confidentiality. Um, so we're, we're going to go back over this and, and, and talk about sort of how we, we arrived at where the ABA in Florida feels right now about, uh, about secure communications. So the duty of competence uh, is sort of the basic one. It's rule 1.1 on the model. It's lawyers shall provide competent representation to a client. Competent representation requires legal knowledge, skill, thoroughness, and preparation, reasonably necessary for the preparation, for the representation. Very, very straightforward, and I feel like we all know it. Uh, but the next comes the duty of confidentiality, the rules of confidentiality. Uh, you know, a lawyer shall make reasonable efforts to prevent the inadvertent or un unauthorized disclosure or unauthorized access to information relating to a client's representation. Florida's law is basically, it, or rule is, is very similar with, with some exceptions uh, regarding client consent. Uh, so going back, uh, when, when email first came on the scene back in the 90s, uh, the ABA in, uh, in its opinion 99-413 said, lawyers have a reasonable expectation of privacy and communications made by all forms of email included unencrypting email sent on the internet, despite some risk of interception and disclosure. So that was a state of the rule at the time. Basically, you didn't have to worry about securing your communications uh, back in 1999. Well, that, that changed. In, um, in 2012, uh, the ABA said a lawyer shall make reasonable efforts to prevent the inadvertent or unauthorized disclosure of or unauthorized ac access to client information relating to the represent representation of the client. So that was basically the same thing, but in the comments they said, and they linked it to the duty of competence, competency, which is where we're at again, where the, the confidentiality and the competency are coming together. They said in, in comment eight in that 2012 opin uh, opinion, to maintain the requisite knowledge and skill, a lawyer should, rep should keep abreast of changes in the law and its practice, including the benefits and risks associated with relevant technology. They need to engage in continuing study and education and comply with all continuing legal education requirements to which a, to which a lawyer is subject. So that's, that's starting to take us in a new direction. It's no longer assuming that your email is secure. It's no longer assuming that your text messaging is secure. It's saying, you need to start paying attention to this. You need to start understanding what is happening and what, what, what you're doing with, with your client's data. So in, in 2017, or yes, the ABA came out with formal opinion 477 which basically codified what a lawyer needs to do to stay competent uh, when, when it comes to protecting their client's confidentiality. This is the final sort of melding of the competency and the confidentiality rules. Um, <clears throat> it, it said that lawyers are now required, uh, to, oh, excuse me, this is a, yeah. Lawyers are required to act competently to safeguard information relating to the representation of a client against unauthorized access by third parties and against inadvertent or unauthorized, unauthorized disclosure. So they have to, there, there's a competency component in how you are exchanging information with your client and using technology. And so it's, it's suddenly on you to have an understanding ethically of, of what you're using and, and how best to communicate with your client. All right, so in the ABA <clears throat> formal opinion 477, they, they set out a bunch of criteria that 
lawyers need to consider when they're protecting their clients' communications. The first is understanding the nature of the threat, which is what we, what we talked about earlier, is understanding that there are folks out there with malicious intent that are gonna use uh, deceptive means to try to, um, to, to breach your network, to break in and, and steal information or use information from it to use that sensitive material. What's also important that lawyers start to understand is how your information is stored and transmitted. So suddenly that's, that, that's a whole new ball game. It's talking about how your firm keeps its information, how your firm transmits its information. You know, what servers are you using? What's, what's your technology? How are you protecting it? It's, it's putting a burden on you to, to start to understand that stuff, which is, you know, obviously sometimes not lawyers fortes because most of us didn't, didn't become lawyers to, uh, could, to be engineers or technologists. We, we became lawyers to persuade and argue and, and advocate for. Uh, it's, it's a different skill set, but it's the ABA is saying that this is something that you need, that you're obligated to understand. Uh, third is understanding and using reasonable electronic security measures, which are, you know, what are the things that are out there and available to you to protect your client information. And that's something that we're gonna get into later in this, in this presentation. So we'll, we'll, we'll talk more about it. Um, <clears throat> you also need to determine how electronic communication about your clients should be protected. And this is, this is interesting. It's, it's not your ID, IT department that needs to make this decision. The ABA here is saying that it's, it's you that needs to make this decision. You, the lawyer who's ethically obligated to protect your client's information needs to, to choose a manner how, on how to do it and what best serves your interests and the clients. Uh, the, uh, the fifth that they talk about is label client information, which is uh, basically the labeling that a lot of us do already. You know, that, that paragraph at the bottom of an email that says if you receive this uh, email and error, blah, 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 uh, you know, please, please return and notify us immediately, all of that. Uh, but it's also, you know, when it's when it's confidential and privileged information, you should do the best you can to label it. Uh, some more on the consideration front is train your lawyers and non-lawyers uh, in in basically how this how this works. That that goes back to the social engineering uh, hacking method we discussed earlier. So it's it's train your folks that work for you, the other lawyers in your firm, your partners. Um, your your admin, your admins, uh, your your paralegals on on this stuff, on on these types of threats, and then how to how to avoid it, how how not to uh, not not to succumb to to uh, the ruse. Uh, so it's it's giving, putting an obligation on you to train your folks uh, to to not not fall for the uh, not fall for the hacking attempts. And the final. Um, <clears throat> uh, component of the rule that the ABA put forth in ABA, ABA formal opinion 477 is basically to conduct due diligence on third-party vendors. Going back to what I was talking about before, how most of us aren't engineers and technologists, we don't know about this stuff. We need to rely on, on third parties to help us, uh, security companies, things like that. And uh, they, they, the ABA actually laid out uh, some, some different uh, items you ought to consider. Uh, one is, uh, you know, check the references and credentials of your vendor, which of, of course makes a lot of sense. Uh, another is vendor security policies and protocols. Now, this is this is something that's a little different. You need to understand how your vendor processes the material, how processes the data, how do they handle it, what do they do with it, uh, whether or not it's it it, com it complies with uh, with your ethical obligations. Uh, we'll get into some more of that later, but it's it's understanding what they do and how they do business. Uh, another uh, um, <clears throat> point that the ABA identified was uh, the use of confidentiality agreements. So when you sign a contract uh, with with a third party vendor to do your security or build your network, you 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 talk about what's going to happen with the client information. You talk about where it's going to be stored. You talk about what if it's going to be cloud based, server based. Where where are those servers going to be located? Uh, things like that. Um, another uh, issue that the ABA identified was vendor's conflict check. Uh, so, you know, just the ability for the, the for the vendor to screen for adversity, uh, if if that's if that's a concern. And finally, and pro probably most importantly, the availability and accessibility of a legal forum for legal relief if there are any breaches of the contract. 
uh, a lot of uh, security companies are going to have their uh, servers overseas somewhere. I mean, you know, are you going to be an ability to assert jurisdiction over that data, over where it's actually located, which is a concern. Uh, you know, most of the time, if you're if you're using a company that's based in the U.S., you should be fine. But it is if if they use third parties to actually store it, how do you get your jurisdiction over them? Uh, it's it's there there are ways to do it, but it's probably best to spell it out in whatever agreement you have, or limit the use of those third parties that are overseas. Now, in in the ABA formal opinion 477, they they talk about different types of data. Uh, they talk about when it needs to be protected and when it doesn't. And uh, what this this is how they determine the reasonable standard uh, that, 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 they, that they laid out. Uh, so the sensitivity of the information is an important consideration. The ABA says that if it's just normal information, like, oh, you have an appointment at this day at this time, that probably doesn't need to be encrypted. Uh, that's you know, versus, uh, you know, um, attorney-client privilege stuff where, where you're, you're talking, you know, about strategy or information or, you know, just, just, their, uh, just, just something involving the case that, that's privileged, that, that should be protected. Um, I would argue that, you know, you don't want to have your people make a determination as to what's the sensitive information and what isn't. It's easier to just have everyone on the same page, but that, that's what they suggest. Um, and further in the, uh, <clears throat> in the reasonable effort standards, they talk about the likelihood of disclosure if additional safeguards are not used. What they're talking about here is the threat, the likelihood of hackers compromising your network. Uh, and as we saw in one of the earlier slides, 40% of uh, lawyers or law firms over 500 attorneys had, had suffered some sort of breach. Uh, so the likelihood seems pretty high. And I think as we learn more and more about the struggles of small and medium-sized firms, we're going to discover that that breaches are a lot more common uh, than than we think, just because people aren't reporting it. It's embarrassing. Why? Why would you want to? Why? Why do you have to? Uh, unless, of course, you're ethically obligated to. Uh, yeah, another factor that they consider is the cost of employing these additional safeguards. How expensive is it to put in? Uh, these systems that, that will protect your communications. Uh, that's something we're also going to get into a little later about encryption. Um, and the final is the difficulty of, or another is the difficulty of implementing the safeguards. Uh, you know, it's how hard is it, but, you know, what are the steps you have to go through uh, to put encryption on, on your communications, on your text messages, or your emails with your clients. And as, as we're going to find out later in this presentation, it's not difficult at all. In fact, it's, it's, it's common. Um, <clears throat> and the final is the extent to which the safeguards adversely affect the lawyer's ability to represent the client, which means, you know, make, doing it in a way where your client's not able to do it, uh, where, where they, they can't handle the encrypted text message or email. Uh, I, I think we'll find that, that people are really uh, capable these days. We all, we all have our phones on us all the time. We know how to use them, but uh, it's, it's, an, it's just another consideration. When, when it comes to employing additional safeguards. So <clears throat> the ABA talks about doing a fact-based analysis when it comes to evaluating whether or not uh, attorneys are appropriately uh, adhering to the reasonable um, effort standard. And, you know, I, again, it's, it would be my contention that you know, you don't want to be making decisions on what's substantive and what's routine. You'd rather just protect everything because sometimes you don't know what's going to be relevant until after a case is wrapped up. And of course, uh, there's always special uh, uh, that uh, special circumstances that the ABA identified where uh, the type of information that is being conveyed is protected by a confidentiality agreement or by some law. Uh, like an SEC law or something like that, where where uh, where the communications need to be protected by statute. So that's just something to be aware of. So sort of a, a summation on the ABA Formal Opinion 477. Um, <clears throat> they make a distinction between routine and substantive. Uh, again, you know. I don't think it's best practice asking your clients or your administrators to make a judgment on what's routine and what's what's substantive. Um, 
you know, I, I take this from my own uh, experience. Uh, I was representing a, uh, an extended hotel uh, in uh, outside of Chicago in an eviction case. It was very, very strange, uh, but we did a lot of corporate work for this company, so I got brought in on it. And I was working with the, the area manager on it, and uh, I had her appear at several hearings, uh, you know, to, to give testimony. And so, you know, she had my cell phone number. It's a good client. And um, uh, we would text uh, about, you know, meet me here at this time, whatever. But as the case went on and as, as it sort of drug on because of the uniqueness of it, she started texting me uh, like Friday, Saturday nights about the attendant just did this or that or something else, you know, something I needed to, to get, you know, that, that she thought I needed. Uh, and she wasn't looking for me to you know, get back, back to her immediately. She was just doing it because it was top of mind. It just happened. She wanted to let me know. And I, I got into a discussion with her and because we hadn't talked about this previously, like, don't just, how about don't text me anymore? And she's like, why? And I, I said, look, you know, I don't have a great way to capture this. Uh, I would get the text messages. And when I got to my office on Monday, or sometimes I do it on Sunday, I would, I would uh, just draft something real quick and note for the file, say what she said, what she said, you know, with timestamps who said what, when they said it in the text message and try to preserve it that way. Uh, saying, you know, that that's probably not the best way to handle this. And so she got it uh -huh, and she would just, uh, you know, send me emails from there on, but she would, she would text me and say, Dave, go check your email. <laughs> um, so even though I told her not to, she still did. We, we, we had created an expectation of texting basically uh, be, because of earlier in the process. And then when she sent something substantive uh, until we had addressed it, um, yeah, I, I would have to find ways to to record it and preserve it. You know, so basically, at 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 the start of any representation, I would recommend that you talk to your client about text messaging if it's something they want to do, and and discuss just security generally with them and how you want to handle it and and what 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 you want to do. Uh, but sincerely, I, I think once people get in the habit of doing something, they're going to keep on doing it. Um, and as, as I pointed out earlier, the, the opinion notes that attorneys need to keep abreast of the knowledge and the benefits of the, of the relevant technology, which is what we're doing here today. Um, it's, it's knowing what's, what's happening in the industry. Uh, something I, I wanted to uh, just mention real quick uh, before we go on, uh, this is something that is, is unique to some jurisdictions. And uh, this is something that I saw as it exists in Florida. There, there are certain data storage requirements that, that are specific for you, for you folks. Uh, so when, when you have these text messages, when you have these emails, when you have these communications, what you need to do with it. Um, <clears throat> so it's the, you need to identify the potential threats to the confidentiality uh, that, that's associated with, with, the, uh, with the storage of the data. So it's on your servers or in the cloud or whatever, but it's, it's how do you continue to protect the confidentiality of the material. Uh, you need to inventory uh, the devices that contain hard drives and or other storage media. So anything that you might have that might um, contain confidential in information and that, that could be a printer, uh, that might be a copier. You just need to have an idea of, of what, which of your devices out there might be storing uh, some of this information. Uh, you need to supervise your non-lawyers uh, and obtain the adequate assurances from third parties that confidentiality will be maintained. Uh, that's, that's those uh, um, clauses to the contract that we talked about earlier. When when you when you contract with those third-party vendors, you want to make sure that there are confidentiality clauses in there that protect your client's data as well as you know this, this yours. Um, <clears throat> and also, you know, when 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 you need to um, <clears throat> decommission a device, uh, you need to ensure that that the device is wiped. Uh, again, you're probably using a third-party vendor for that, but you need to make sure that they're not retaining any of the information and that the devices are, are wiped effectively. All right, so <clears throat> is texting ethical? Yes, there's no prohibition that exists on texting. There's not one in Florida that I, I could find and there's not one uh, that the ABA cites. You know, but uh, you are responsible to ensure that your communications are secure. Now, before we, we get on to further uh, talk about <clears throat> securing your communications and how best to do that. Uh, there, there's another wrinkle uh, that in Florida I wanted to mention. Uh, it's a solicitation of new clients via text messaging. Now, um, text message solicitations in Florida is permissible, uh, but you need, there are a couple of different things you need to do. 
the first line of the test text must say that it's an advertisement. So, you know, it's, it's, it's having that, this is an advertisement. This is, this is a legal advertisement that that needs to be the first component of it. Uh, you need to keep track of who, of, of who receives the text and what exactly what was in the content. So if you send it out and then a client or a potential client responds to it, you need to hold on to that material and preserve it. Uh, the lawyers must ensure that the prospective client is not responsible for the data costs by working with uh, cell phone service providers, uh, which, yeah, I, I, I think that that's, a, that's an arrangement you, you can come to. Um, and you must have a method for prospective clients to opt out, uh, which is, you know, we, you see it a lot in email, where, where you get an email from, from whomever uh, that, that's asking you to buy something from them. There's always an opt-out provision. Any, any sort of uh, advertisement email, you can always opt out of it, as well as you know, the do not call list and things like that. Uh, the reason why this is so critical in, in Florida, and uh, did some research on this, but when businesses send text messages out, this is just general businesses, not law firms specific, 82% of them are opened. Uh, this is from a flow route survey that I found. Uh, but in when uh, businesses send out uh, solicitations uh, to consumers via email, only one in four uh, are, are received. And there, there's something like uh, three out of four, uh, this is a ZipWhip survey did this, uh, the 2019 uh, state of texting survey that said that three out of four consumers want to text with the business. So when they get that, uh, that, that solicitation, they want to be able to respond to it. Like, uh, you know, for instance, you're sending um, you know, an email, a uh, text message out to your uh, former clients or whatever database you have about, you know, let's say estate planning because it says, hey, has there been a change in your life? You know, contact us about estate planning. Uh, the client's going to want to try to set something up, you know, potentially set up or at least interact with you on it. So that, that's just a, that's just interesting information. It sounds like an effective marketing device. So we, we, we talked about law firms at risk uh, earlier about how uh, your, your communications with your clients are being targeted because of the value of them, because of you know, the, the financial information, the IP information, the legal strategy information, uh, just earnings information that they can trade on. It's, it's critical. And using a non-secure communication, communication channel can be a breach of your ethical responsibility. So that's a significant risk indeed. So what are the steps that you as a law firm can take to protect yourself uh, when, when you're communicating, uh, mobile communications? One is password protection, which is pretty straightforward. Uh, you should use something that is sophisticated. You should, it shouldn't be password or one, two, three, four, five, or something like that. You should try to come up with something unique. Uh, and that's, that's difficult to do uh, because it's, it's hard to remember. So, you know, I would suggest using a password manager to help you with that. Uh, the next is multi-factor authentication. Now, what multi-factor authentication is, is a security system that requires one or more method of authentication from, uh, from, from the person who's trying to access it. So, for instance, um, you, go to a, you go to an ATM or a cash machine and you want to take your money out, you put your card in, you enter a PIN, that's multi-factor authentication. Uh, when you, uh, you want to log into your, your iPhone, you, you might have, um, you know, for instance, a, pa uh, a, a passcode or a fingerprint or something like that. Um, or sometimes when you're logging in on the websites and you're trying to use, do something, you're, there's, there's a security question as well as your password. So it's, it's a couple of steps in the protection. It's not simply one thing. Uh, let's see, the next is uh, hardware firewalls, which is pretty straightforward. Uh, there's encryption protocols for data sharing. That's basically, um, that, that goes back to your social engineering. That's, that, that's having rules and procedures uh, at, at your firm that governs how people interact with, with this information, how they communicate with their clients. Um, the next is uh, training. It's, it's training those people. That's also a component of the social engineering, but it's, it's keeping them, uh, keeping them trained and, and updated on any changes that you do. And it's, it's probably doing it on a regular basis. Uh, so everyone stays up on, on how they're supposed to be handling things. Uh, and the final is testing to ensure compliance. Once you install a system, once you have, oh, you're using something, you need to test to make sure that people are doing what they're supposed to be doing. Um, 
I was actually talking to a, uh, a security company here in uh, South Florida yesterday about this, and they, they, were, they were telling me about a case that they were called in on where uh, a bank client uh, had been hacked, and they've been hacked through a, um, a uh, uh, basically a, a, a link they had with a uh, Western state government, um, like uh, about whatever. And they, they basically had all the, the protocols and stuff in place. Uh, they had, uh, you know, logs, uh, logging all the, the exchanges of data packets and information going back and forth. But no one was looking at the logs. No one saw that uh, it, the actual breach had occurred months before uh, it was ever discovered. Uh, so that, that kind of goes into the training. It's, it's having these systems in place, but then making sure that there's someone actually monitoring it and keeping an eye on things and, and looking out for, for red flags so you can you can act appropriately and step in to protect your client's information. Uh, so the, the weakness in regular text messaging is abundant. There's a, a vulnerability due to hand off to mediar intermediaries, which basically means how texting works is you send a, a text on your phone, uh, just a regular SMS, and it bounces from server and server and goes through the network until it lands on, on your intended recipient's uh, phone. Uh, so in, in those, those different servers in between can have different levels of security. And if, if it's a plain text, it's not encrypted, it can be read at different spots. Uh, if it's, so if there's a lack of encryption, it can be read or intercepted earlier. Uh, there, there's issues with spoofing. Uh, Mike Mansky, our partner in this, uh, you know, once while I was sitting at a table with him because he has the appropriate tools, uh, called me from his phone using a spoof number. Uh, I have a cell phone number, but he was able to change it while we were sitting there in like two minutes. So <laughs> he, he was able to make that change. Um, another issue on data on device is the data that resides on the device, which we'll get more into later, along with network connection exposure, which we'll get more into. Uh, and you know, individual error, people making mistakes. Uh, I, was, I was on a guy's trip a few weeks ago and um, <clears throat> We, we a friend of ours uh, was you know just recently changed his cell phone number so and someone else had gotten his cell phone his old cell phone number so we we're basically texting this person out there all of our plans and what we were doing without knowing that he wasn't included uh, it's very embarrassing um, okay <clears throat> so reasonable efforts in the current environment there's uh, the encry encryption industry standard is AIES 256 bit AES stands for uh, basic well it is it's an advanced encryption standard. And it is a symmetric key algorithm, meaning that the same key is used for both encrypting and decrypting the data. Um, <clears throat> and the other reasonable effort is end-to-end -end encryption. Sorry, I'm speeding up a little bit. It looks like we're running out of time. So what is 256-bit encryption? Uh, basically, it's a standard that the US, US government requires that all sensitive and important data be encrypted using this 192 to 256-bit encryption methods. Uh, it's, it's what your banks use. It's it's basically, it creates a 78 digit number uh, that, uh, that, that is the encryption key. Now that's, that's one in, uh, basically to, to have a shot at breaking it, it's, it's a one in over 115 quatervergentillion, which is a number, uh, which is an incredibly big number, uh, which makes these, these transactions incredibly secure on, on the commercial market. Um, <clears throat> It's, it's, it's not unbeatable because, you know, it, well, first of all, anyone who tells you that an encryption is unbeatable, you should walk away from immediately and, and not to talk to any more about it because um, everything can eventually be broken. Uh, from what we know right now, in order to break something to like 256 bit, you'd probably need to be uh, basically have a supercomputer at the Pentagon or something very serious, be a government actor, be one of those top research institutes that, that has access to the supercomputing power in order to break it. Uh, you know, it will it eventually be available one day down the line to, to regular hackers? You know, it's a possibility, but you know, no, no promises. Um, and so that, that leads us to end-to-end -end encryption, which is, which is common and something that you should insist on. End-to-end uh, -end encryption basically means passing that bag of sand, when I, when I, a bag of sand. So you run uh, your data into this encryption program that, that encrypts the information. It passes the information, the texting from server to server, like we talked about, secure or not. If anyone intercepts it, they're just seeing a bag of sand. They, it's undecipherable, they, they can't figure out what it says. And then when it arrives at its destination, 
when that recipient has the decryption code, it pulls it down and, and you can read it. Uh, so it, it protects that, that transit. Uh, something I want to touch on real quick before, before we move on is encryption on your cell phone. 95% uh, of lawyers, and that's, that, that's the number, use iPhones. Uh, when you're texting within the Apple, you get those blue bubbles. So uh, blue bubble means that you're texting someone else as an Apple, and the Apple messaging has 128-bit encryption. So that means uh, it's, it's encrypted. But if you're texting to someone who's outside, of, of Apple, who uses an Android, who uses some other, some other type of device, you're going to get green bubble. Or when you send a, a green, uh, a just a straight text message to an Apple user, you get that green bubble. And that means it's unencrypted. It's just plain text. So it can be deciphered. It can be intercepted. So here's how basically encryption works. Uh, you start with information. You run it through a bunch of times. It's, I am not the encryption person, uh, but if you have any questions about how this works, I, I'm happy to give it to you. Uh, I, I'll, I'll, I'll refer it to, to my partner and we'll, we'll get you the answer. Uh, just if there, are, if there are 10 rounds of this process with the shifting uh, rows and sh mixing of columns, uh, 10 rounds is 128 bit, uh, 12 rounds is 192, 14 rounds is the 256 bit. That's, that's where you get the, the logarithmic uh, power to the 256 uh, that we were talking about earlier, uh, the, the 78 digit number. Um, data on your device is something that you need to be uh, concerned about. Um, when, you, when you're text messaging uh, or you're using like a WhatsApp or something like that, uh, the data actually resides on your device. Uh, so that, that becomes a problem because when it's on your device, it's unencrypted. Uh, unless, it's, unless you're using an application or messaging through it, that is encrypted. The information's available. Uh, you'll find that you know, we, we have our Bluetooth on all the time. Uh, people who uh, you know, because we use our headphones or for our car, whatever reason, uh, you can obtain tools pretty easily to be able to uh, hack into a person's Bluetooth network uh, because it's not encrypted and be able to read the data that's on their phone. Uh, you know, uh, it's, it's fairly easy to do. Um, it's also an issue if you're, you know, connected to public Wi-Fi. So it's, it's something to be concerned about and it's, it's relatively easy. Um, an issue that we talk about a lot is storing this data on the cloud as opposed to on uh, physical servers that, that you can access um, that, that are nearby. Uh, so basically what this is, what the cloud is, is endless data centers and an endless network. There's redundancy. It's fast because of the increase in uh, capacity and it, it costs a lot lower than, than having your own setup. Um, it gives you worldwide access, uh, more storage. Uh, you need to obviously Go to a cloud provider to do it, which would be Amazon, Google, uh, Apple, someone like that. Uh, and it's it's relatively easy to set up. It's autom it updates automatically. Um, there's a reduced cost. There are like free applications on it, like Dropbox and things like that. Uh, there's there's drawbacks to it though. Uh, you're you're contracting with a third party to handle all your data, which we we spoke about earlier. That you need to vet those folks. Uh, there there's a privacy consideration, uh, but you know, more than likely, uh, if you use one of these cloud providers, they're going to assist on password protection and they'll have their own level of encryption. Uh, there is, of course, a loss of control with the information and uh, you're relying on the Internet uh, in order to access the cloud and, and your, your firm's information. If you decide to store it on the cloud, you have to be able to connect it to the Internet. You can't use it uh, when you're on an airplane or something like that. But, but this, uh, when you use a cloud-based messaging app, uh, here's, here's what it does for you. <clears throat> uh, for instance, uh, you go on your phone and you put it in airplane mode and you try to access your text messages. Uh, we've done that uh, in the past. We, we did it with WhatsApp. You can read everything because it resides on your phone. Uh, we did that with the, uh, with the Apple uh, and it resides on your phone there too. Uh, what we did, our, our, our application is cloud-based, so none of the information actually real, uh, sits on your phone. It's, it draws, it comes down from whatever device you're on. So, if you lose your cell phone or something like that, like if you lose your, your phone um, and someone is able to open it, they, they can read your text messages because it sits there even if it's not connected to a network. But if, if you use cloud-based applications, you know, you have that extra layer of security where if a phone is lost, as long as they don't have the credentials, they're not going to be able to access that information. So if they steal your phone, it's, 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 it's not worth much then. Now, when, when we're talking about uh, cloud-based solutions for stuff, uh, there, there's an ethical component to it. And in Florida, fortunately, is one of those states that's permissible, 
provided you you adhere to certain uh, rules. Um, so you need to ensure that the online data storage provider has enforceable obligation to preserve confidentiality. That that's having that agreement in place. Uh, you need to investigate how they store uh, the information, looking at their security measures, policies, things like that. They're asking you to be familiar with where your client's data is going to go, uh, which is you know pretty reasonable. And then you know employing the uh, available technology to guard against reasonable or, un or foreseeable attempts to infiltrate the data that is stored. Now it's the available technology that goes back to the 256-bit encryption. Um, that is widely available. Uh, all most of your West, uh, messaging apps are going to have some encryption on there. It's 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 making sure that that you're utilizing encryption in your communications, in your texts with your clients, so that you know that you're protected. Um, a question that that we we struggle with is the use of uh, ephemeral platforms uh, for texting solutions rather than uh, than than something like uh, WhatsApp or what we do. Um, the, the problem with that is you're basically destroying information. Uh, there, there was a uh, basically an opinion that came out by the Justice Department, their uh, Foreign Corrupt Practices Unit, where they had uh, businesses that were required to self-report documents for whatever reason, uh, who were overseas in non-favorable jurisdictions like China or Russia, and they would use these 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 platforms in order to communicate back and forth, so the the information would go away. So when, when they had someone who was over in China or Russia, for whatever reason, they, they can communicate back home easily and, and uh, worry less about in, uh, interception. The problem is, is there was no record of the transaction. So if they were just talking about routine things, not a big deal, but of course, if they get into the habit of texting and suddenly they're talking about a deal or something like that, something that they need to report on, that information is gone. Uh, the Justice Department suggested to them that they uh, draft memos to the file in the event of uh, you know, whenever these exchanges occur, but unfortunately, um, you know, when, when you're on the road, when you're in the field, it becomes very hard to do that, and sometimes it doesn't happen. Um, so that that's really the problem with uh, ephemeral platforms. Uh, I'm just going to move forward a little bit, uh, and this material will be available to you. Um, so when we're we as lawyers are not really in the business of destroying client communication, so that's why the ephemeral platforms are not particularly suitable for what we try to do. Uh, you know, when I, when I was in the corporate side, I would follow up, or I, when, when, I, when I practiced, I would follow up uh, client, you know, client phone calls over sensitive information, uh, you know, settlement authority, things like that, with, with an email uh, to let folks in the organization know that I've been authorized, in the client organization know that I've been authorized to do this. Uh, that's just the best practice. Uh, and you know we want to preserve as much as we can just as a, a way to mitigate our risk and liability in case there's a misunderstanding later on. <clears throat> and truly finding something that gives you an unalterable record is really the best practice where something that, that can't be um, can't, can't be spoofed, can't be altered. Uh, something that everyone gets the copy and it's, it cannot be changed. Uh, that's, that, that, that's critical because then, you know, that's, that, that's something you can rely on as evidence and really to, to protect your organization, yourself and your, and, and your interactions with your client. Okay, uh, so we're gonna touch again on the third party, uh, talking about those folks you bring in to help you. Um, Again, and we went on, on this earlier uh, about the, these things that you need to be considering when you decide to hire a third party. Uh, it's, it's looking at their hiring practices. It's using those confidentiality agreements. It's having those policies and protocols in place uh, and understanding that they exist to protect you and your client. Now in Florida, there is a specific standard and here it is. Uh, it's, it's the lawyer's duty to investigate the online do data storage uh, provider security measures, uh, their policies, their uh, their methods for recovery, and any other pr uh, procedure that might be in place that that is adequate under the circumstances. So that that those are the things when you practice here in Florida that you must keep in mind. Um, so really, you know, what is it that you're looking for? You're, you're looking for something that's transparent. You're looking for something uh, when when you're communicating with text messaging. You're looking for something that's transparent, an application that's transparent, something that's instant, something that's secure, something that's unalterable. Uh, and that's that's what my company does. That's that's what EIE Legal does. Uh, we've we've developed this uh, in order to put what we call encrypted transparency in the palm of your hands. It's designed with law firms in mind, so they can communicate with their clients in a secure fashion, 
while creating that unalterable record uh, to basically protect the lawyer from from liability. Um, and that's that's all about all I have for you today. Uh, if you have any uh, questions, uh, we can deal with those now. Uh, otherwise, uh, my contact information is right here for you. So, uh, Lisa, do we have any questions? Uh, let's see. So there was a question. Um, you did explain uh, the how encryption works because you. I remember that you said it, it bounces around. There's 256 bit. Um, this question was, can you describe how encryption works and how much it costs? So is okay. there a cost associated with the encryption? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's 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 going to be you know going through whatever secure messaging app. You're not you're not paying for the um, for like the development of the encryption or things like that. This is all stuff that's that's a lot of it is is publicly available. Uh, the 256 bit is publicly available, so you should be able to to talk to uh, a security provider and they'll they'll be able to acquire that for you. How they install it, uh, there'll be different costs associated with that, but it is readily available. Uh, what makes us different is that uh, we use a 256 bit. Uh, plus uh, some pro proprietary stuff that we just got our patent on. So it's, it's better than the 256 bit, but it's it really uh, from, from doing an, an evaluation, uh, if it's reasonable to install it, uh, it's, it's very, very inexpensive. Uh, our app is available on the App Store right now at, at $4.99 per month subscription. Uh, you can get uh, apps like Signal for free. So it's, it's something that, that's easy to use. Okay, excellent. Um, well, that's awesome. Let's see. Uh, I'm also a mediator. Can you give us some guidelines on communicating with parties after the in-person sessions, e.g. settlements that often result after the parties go home? So uh, you're, you're talking about conferring uh, with, with, I mean, it's, it's whatever your, your obligations are as a mediator. Um, you know, I, I, I think, you know, the whole point of mediation is that you can talk with them uh, confidential confidentially, uh, I, I would imagine, and, and not have the those discussions revealed. So, you know, as, as a best practice, I, I think you'd want to use something like that uh, to be able to create that record so you can protect yourself if there's a, a, a um, uh, any sort of accusation of impropriety later on. Uh, I, I think you'd want to have a record of it. Got it. Um, here's another one. If you use encrypted text, does the client need to have some special capability to unencrypt the message? No. Uh, so like what, what I was talking about, what our company developed, uh, you would both have to have the app. Uh, and I would encourage you to check out our website and learn more about it. But if it's if you're going to have an encrypted environment aside from from like your iPhone encryption, where it's it only goes to other in iPhones that that's encrypted end to end. But it does reside on the device so you can intercept it. Uh, but if it's if you're talking to your client securely, you want to have that end to end encryption where it doesn't reside on their phone. So you'd want to use a cloud-based security application, and they would they would have to have it as well. Uh, it, it couldn't just be one person. It needs to be both to maintain the encrypted environment. Okay, let's see. Um, here's here's a two for one. Hmm. Is the EIE Legal Mobile app available for Android as well as iPhone users? And if not, do you know if any non-Apple devices that have similar encrypting to the Apple products, like Samsung? Uh, I, I don't know. The second part, I don't know. Uh, the first part, uh, Apple, it's uh, the EIE legal app is available on both the App Store and uh, Google Play. Uh, and we can do white label versions. So if you're, you're interested, you know, come check us out. We can build it for your organization. Uh, part of the things that we, uh, I, I didn't discuss because we were running out of time, is basically setting up the world of, of communication. Um, you know, the, the human error, if, if you can limit the database of people who can be involved, the better it is. And so, you know, apps like applications like EA Legal allows you to do that. Whereas a WhatsApp, you know, there are, there are millions of people on it. It's it's easy to screw up. Um, so it's, it's like in the Taiwan case. So it's, we're, we're on both those stores. Please check us out. Awesome. And I am sorry that I, we did not show it on the screen. However, this CLE, just so you guys are aware, I will also type this number in the chat on the right side of your uh, GoToWebinar control panel. The CLE course number for this is 3596. Again, that is course number 3596, and I'm going to send that to the entire audience in the chat. 
This CLE course has been approved for one hour of general credit, including one hour of technology and one hour or and one hour of ethics. Um, in case you missed anything about the presentation today, you will receive the recording and the slides tomorrow afternoon via email. So if you missed any of it, you can recap using the recording um, and you could still get credit for the CLE with the course number. Uh, David, thank you so much for being with us today. We are very appreciative. It, there was a very informative CLE. There was a lot of information to cover. And uh, thanks for doing a great job. We enjoyed having you here today. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciated it. And uh, when you when you folks get the slides, uh, all the links on them will, will go to the various rules uh, that, that you should take a look at. Okay, awesome. All right, thank you, everybody. We hope you have a fantastic afternoon and have a great week.